free speech online. We want to go back to a much more regulated speech environment like the U.S. had for 50 years up to the 1980s. That's a debate, we, it's a legitimate debate, it's a debate we're not having. Instead, we're retreating into this kind of fantasy that we used to have a reality-based, fact-based, truth-based, holist, and journalism world, and somehow it all went away. I think that's just <laughs> not true. So I'm sorry to be so forceful in pushing back, but I, I it just, as an ex-journalism dean, I just, I'm driven close to madness by having to go to panel discussions on fake news as if there was never any such thing before Election Day 2016. I mean, that's not... Except that's, that's the fake news. <laughs> There's something new. Anyway, um, so in terms of your sense of what, I mean, is there any, do you feel like there's a kind of a, a uh, a, rea a reality out there uh, that's that's made up of, of facts and as well as stories but, uh, that you grapple with, or is it is that just a name that gets tacked onto something? I mean, how do you understand facts in terms of you know, what you do when you're writing your, your various pieces? Recently? No, I mean, I, I think there are. Um, I think there are. I agree with Nick. I think there are such things. In fact, I think there are. Um, there are more reliable sources um, uh, than uh, of information than than others, and um, you can. And there there are people who, um, you know, try to under you know who who, who try to who tr who gather information in a I think in a in a in a kind of methodologically kind of honest way, and, and uh, or who get information and then kind of subject it to. Critical thinking and, and other people who don't, you know, and um, one of the challenges I think, um, I mean, I, I do think the fact that um, there's off, in a lot of places there's an expectation that pe of that people that you're supposed to that you have to write very very fast can be challenging in that regard. I mean, even just think about, you know, when I think about, you know, I used to write. I, I, I just feel like there's a general expectation that that. You know, um, in many places now, that if there's an event, people should write in response to it very quickly. And so, oftentimes, what that leads people to do is kind of, you know, look on the internet, find a couple of things, throw it in as links, and then kind of throw it at their wishes. I think um, uh, oftentimes can lead to the recycling of information that's misleading or or, mm -hmm. or false. Um, and that um, uh, so that's one challenge. I mean, I also think that. Um, I don't know, you know, I think I think I kind of came out quickly in the 1980s, so certainly at a time when liberals thought that Ronald Reagan was a total moron and likely to blow up the world. So that was two pretty harsh indictments, I think. Um, um, but um, I feel like, maybe this is not a direct answer, I feel like what's, my sense is that, that there was, um, What's, what's different today politically, and I think influences the way people write, is that um, the then, the, there was more, um, the, the world of the political right now um, is, is considered over, almost entirely not culturally respectable in kind of polite company for liberals at all. You know, it's basically like, you know, when I talk to you know, younger people, I think it's almost kind of, until proven innocent, you know, conservatives, conservatism is, Conservatives are, are ignorant and racist, um, and um, I think that there was more of a um, in the, in in the in the 80s there was more of a a kind of a highbrow conservatism that I think liberals kind of you know um, took more a little bit more seriously, um, and um, I think that was a uh, um, and if you you know and and there were. I think if you went through the 1980s, you, and by the end of it, you might have, as a, someone on the left or liberal, you might have you might have been forced to say by the end of it, well, maybe we were wrong. Liberals were wrong about some things, and maybe conservatives might have been right about some things. Some things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's a kind of experience that um, uh, that, uh, that I think that was a generational experience that is much less common today. So I think all of that's had. An impact. I mean, when I when I was kind of came, you know, when I was came, it was like if you were thinking about who like the conservatives you would read would be, it would be you know, you think like you'd read George Will, you know, 
Yeah. Now, I mean, I think there's a you can there's a big difference between between seeing George Will as your embodiment of kind of conservative political opinion and Breitbart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, uh, at my graduate school, uh, the, the professor, one of the professors I worked under said he wouldn't have minded having George Will as one of his students mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when he was on the left, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it's hard to see how he would admit to having any of his friends being conservatives, mm -hmm. <laughs> so-called conservatives these days. Um, um, okay, let's, uh, one of the things, I guess another question I have that, you know, before we sort of get to this issue of sort of actuality and how uh, uh, you write about that, is how you write about, or, or the, the relationship of sort of deeper, or I don't know about deeper, but more general phenomena in politics that have become um, virtually facts for uh, many people writing political theory. One being uh, the growing gap and uh, the growing inequality and uh, uh, between segments of the population and climate change. And these are not, they don't necessarily amount to daily events, mm -hmm. but they're presences in some ways. And when you, <coughs> and you know, and their importance for life, that is to say the, the, the integrity of the political community if we're talking about inequality, and the integrity of humanity, if you're talking about climate change. I mean, this is, these are uh, issues that um, obviously, uh, that uh, are, are relevant on a day-to-day -day basis for us. And so as, d does that, do they um, affect, um, do you think that they affect what journalists do or what, what, what you do? I mean, or, is, or is what you're so focused on you know what you need to get done. That it's not really it's something you know for political theorists to muse about, but not really for journalists to write about, unless there's some report that comes out from the UN. Well, I personally write a lot about inequality, and I have yeah. a book coming out in September that's a lot about inequality. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, just my work as a journalist, I, I, I would give a big yes to that being something that I try to cover. Mm -hmm. Now the way I would cover it as a journalist, the way you would cover it as a political theorist would be quite different. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, you know, I wouldn't say that's not journalism. I would say that mm -hmm. is journalism. Right. With climate change, I haven't written about it, uh, but I have been, you know, associated with uh, a lot of efforts <coughs> in the journalism school to train people to cover it. We have a whole, like, unit at the journalism school that does nothing but cover climate change, and we train journalists to a level of scientific literacy where they can write adeptly about this. So, so I would give a resounding yes to journalists doing <coughs> those kind of things. How about in terms of the Atlantic? Or um, I mean, the, yeah, there are people who write, you know, m mostly either on climate change or on economic inequality. I think that I don't write, um, in terms of the various particular policy debates inside those are neither of those are things that I write about a lot uh, <coughs> but um, I do think that um, the both of those huge kind of macro uh, phenomenon um, I do think about sometimes I think I write about the way that they impact American political debate so again just this piece I've been talking about today I don't think that it's a, the fact that um, uh, there's a the, the, the question, the fact that there's now a real question about whether, in the Democratic Party, whether corporations should be considered legitimate political actors that should have a seat at the table inside the Democratic Party, um, which was not really, n not nearly as much of a debate, up, uh, you know, up before 2016, um, and particularly fossil fuel companies, um, has a lot to do with widening income inequality and with climate change. Um, so these are, these are kind of results of that. Interesting. Interesting. So, one more question and then we'll open it up. Um, <coughs> uh, and that is that uh, um, at, uh, during your careers, you've, you may have made mistakes uh, or gotten it wrong. And uh, could you 
talk about that in because if you've got it wrong, that means that it implies that there was a way of getting it right. There was something that you should have known that you didn't know. And, uh, and could you talk about that learning experience, I guess? For me, um, again, this is something I've spent a lot of my life on because of the teaching, the evidence of the mm -hmm. force and so on. So I'd answer that with a resounding yes. So, you know, there's a difference between facts and truth, obviously. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of culture around journalism. I've worked only at news organizations that have fact checkers for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of, you know, I'm not going to spell your name wrong in a published article because mm -hmm. even if I do, somebody will check me on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a big, big believer in fact checking. So that's, but that's different. You know, the kind of problems you get into are uh, framing, um, uh, failing to do hypothesis testing, things like that. I issues get set up in a certain way, and, and as a journalist, you, you, you tend to sort of take that on board and not realize that you're accepting the way something is framed. Mm -hmm. So I, I've had to, had, I've had bad experiences with that and in earlier in life, and that's part of what led me to have this very intense involvement with social scientists mm -hmm. to try to have ways not to, you know, do that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, when I was young, um, I was there was this thing called the underclass debate, mm -hmm. and I uh, spent a lot of time covering the underclass debate, mm -hmm. and um, that's a case where I came to feel I had accepted a, a kind of framing of. of, mm -hmm. of how to understand a set of issues uh, almost by absorption. And I hadn't trained myself how to say, well, maybe there's another way to look at it. So that would be my example. And again, I don't want to take too much time. I could go into some detail about that if you want. Mm -hmm. <coughs> maybe you could just refresh our memories of, about what the underclass issue Well, I'll tell you a, my, a sort of epiphany. Well, it, it was it was the idea, and it's not untrue and it's not unsupportable by data that there's a sort of group of people in the United States who are kind of stuck at the bottom and are associated with certain kinds of, you know, labor market experiences, family structures, substance use, living in distressed neighborhoods with concentrated poverty, etc. You know, it's not a completely crazy idea, and the biggest thing that's changed uh, since I was covering it all those years ago is then it was understood as a black thing, and now it's clearly a multiracial thing. Um, but, but, you know, the word has kind of gone away, but the phenomenon hasn't gone away. For me, the big epiphany was, um, was when Ronald Reagan was running for president for the first time, and... Uh, in the 76? No, no, I'm sorry, in 1980, his okay. success, first successful okay. race. Okay. And I was a reporter for the Washington Post at the time. And Reagan, a lot of, one of his motifs was running against welfare mothers. Yeah. Um, so I went to, uh, uh, I wrote a long series for the Washington Post about a welfare mother in Philadelphia, sort of embedded with her. Mm -hmm. um, a woman named Mary Manley who worked in, lived in North Philadelphia. Uh, by the way, very near where one of my sons now has his job. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I was like, I was the liberal reporter, I was defending her. Uh, you know, she's not a lazy loafer, she's not living it up on welfare benefits. I was describing her life. I believe I described her life accurately. But um, <coughs> I felt that I was accepting a typical Washington reporter's framework, <coughs> which is everything about the key to understanding this person is U.S. government welfare policy. So I was just endlessly interviewing her. Now tell me about exactly how you spend your welfare check. When does it arrive? And and you know, at the end of the story, I just said, "This is I did not do the right story. If I wanted to understand this person and the neighborhood and everything." The way to understand it is not that it's a you know dependent variable of the U.S. welfare system. 
Um, so that was kind of a big epiphany yeah. for me yeah. um, on how you can unconsciously accept frames that keep you from understanding the deeper truth of a situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And so, uh, Peter, if you could comment on this question about uh, having written something and I mean, you can also talk about you know, brilliant articles that you've written, but mm -hmm. I mean, things that went where you might have um, felt that you got it wrong, and you've yeah. talked about this with Iraq, and, yeah. that, and then what yeah. Uh, yeah. what led you to change, and how do you, is it a matter of knowledge, or is it a matter, what is it a matter of? I think, like Nick's point about framing, I think so much of it is, has to do with the, the kind of, the, the, the storyline, or the kind of, the, 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 um, <coughs> the way in which one, Imagine something. I mean, I was just—I was thinking about this. This is—I'll get to rock second, but I was thinking about so. In, you know, we've been dealing for the last couple of years all the stuff about Russia meddling in the election. So, I thought, well, you know, there really hasn't been very much about Americans meddling in other countries' right. elections, and so, and 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 like, shouldn't <coughs> shouldn't liberals believe that there should should liberals believe there should be a universal standard about? This is when it's okay to, I mean, and I started thinking, like, what if, if the European Union takes out ads saying, vote for Hillary Clinton because Donald Trump's climate change policies are bad for the world, is that, a, is it just that, uh, is the issue sovereignty? Like, you don't mess, you know, or is the issue, um, is the issue that you have to be open about it, or is the issue that if you're a democracy, or if you're in pursuit of democracy, <coughs> what, if, what if, what if a bunch of countries fund voter registration drives in African-American neighborhoods. Is that? And yeah, so, and I just... That, that's a great... And let me just add, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. that's exactly the kind of question journalists aren't trained to ask that they should ask. Iraq War, I remember at one moment, you know, going on some website of some national security think tank and finding out that 38 countries mm -hmm. had active weapons of mass destruction programs. Right, right. So, I, I kind of thought, that was a to me a great example of framing, because the framing was, there's this thing called WMD, right. that was like a policy wonk thing right. that right. suddenly everybody was talking about, and if a country's got WMD, you got to go take them out. Right, right, Well, why right. are we taking out the other 37 countries? Right, right, and right, I remember even for the, Repu finally, even the Republic, which was kind of disastrous, pro-war, Greg Easterbrook wrote a piece saying, what do you mean WMD? Chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, yeah, if someone drops a yeah. nuclear bomb, chemical weapons and biological weapons is not actually a weapon of mass destruction most of the time anyway. Like, you don't really kill a lot of people with these things. So, um, anyway, I, it's funny though, just thinking about, because just recently, so, so I went out to think, okay, well, like, does the United States, is what the United States does different than what we think Russia might have done? And what was so interesting about it, and, and realized <coughs> that I was just felt like I was peeling away an onion, is I talked to two categories of people. And it's interesting that sociologically, the two categories were very similar. They were Obama, former Obama people who worked on farm, U.S. foreign policy, and academics. And I asked them about the same set of things, some things that I had read about that happened in Latin America and some other places in Russia, and the academics were like, is that a serious question? Of course. Like, we're the world's leaders in doing this. We've been doing it for a hundred years. Like, of course, we do it all the time. And there are these, you know, chart, you know, it's data sets, uh, 75 interventions, and blah, blah, blah. And the former Obama people, you know, some of who are now, like, at NGOs, like, they're not, you know, like, liberals, were like, no, 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 no. We, we have good intentions. We may mess up, but we promote democracy. We, we do not subvert governments for the sake of American national interest. And I was thinking, like, I just got to get you guys together to hear you talk about this. Because, and it also made me realize that part of the challenge was that they meant something totally different than democracy. So, like, in a lot of these Latin American countries, what, what the, the Obama people saw these countries as democracies because they had some kind of election, but the lefty academics didn't really see them as democracies in a meaningful sense. They basically saw them as the same old elite was basically running things, if a lefty Chavez person type came in, they would be basically o got overthrown. So there wasn't really a, there was kind of a very constrained, thin, like all of, anyway, and I was just, and I also was struggling but it because it was so, I felt like I was off on an island because so little conversation was happening about this. And then the same thing, you know, so I, I still feel like really at sea about this. And, and this is where in some ways like, what I find frustrating is like, let's take US sanctions policy towards Iran, which is something I've written about a little bit, right? Like, there are these health studies now that show that like basically because of this, the severity of the global sanctions that the Obama administration put in, 
basically shutting Iran off from like basically economic transactions <coughs> with banks and companies. The Iranians can't import pharmaceuticals, and they can't import the raw materials to make their own pharmaceuticals. So millions of people aren't getting the drugs they need, mm. right? Like, it's funny in the United States, you can talk about Israel. Like, you can have a, you can have more of a, there's more of a conversation about about the moral problems of Israel's blockade in Gaza. There's very little conversation about that. Like, people might say it's smart to have sanctions. We got to do it to get to the nuclear deal we want. Blah blah. But like that sense that like maybe there's a terrible moral thing that a terrible thing the United States is doing. Like again, in the academy, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, tell me something I didn't know. But like. <laughs> You can go from the New York, you go from the Academy to the New York Times op-ed page, and that discourse kind of disappears. Right. And and I and I guess this is you know, no Trump's the other people have read, but I, I guess I just struggle with this myself. I, I don't mm. I wanna be I would love to, what I would ideally like to be is some person who could stand in the middle of that with a slightly skeptical eye towards both places and try to kind of translate some of that stuff, but I don't really haven't figured out how to do it very effectively. So I mean just in terms of the Obama policies on Iran, there was, of course, the Clinton policies uh, in terms of the no-fly zone from Iraq. And the right. sanctions on Iraq, which and were, sanctions, right. I mean, the, the, uh, had a, an astonishing uh, uh, effect on, 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 on the, you know, health and right. state of that society, you know, and, and yet, but even that has not really been, it's not, again, it's not really something which is part of mainstream discourse. But, but I think, you know, most of my academic friends, and I live in a university, Literally, I live in Columbia Housing, so I, I have a lot of academic friends. It, 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 I have a hard time explaining how journalism works. So um, there, there's, uh, I would argue that the, the kind of mistakes Peter is talking about, in the case of most journalists, a, a lot of my academic and other friends think they're, they're constrained in these ways because they're getting orders from their publisher, you know. Uh, when I'll say to my academic friends, I believe that, you know, the Salzberger family never tells uh, the editor of the New York Times what line to take in coverage. They just can't believe it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but my sense is the real problem is that journalists just absorb the conventional wisdom and the conventional framing on things don't ask the more kind of profound questions mm -hmm. that Peter was asking, mm -hmm. and, and, and less <coughs> that it's sort of forced or imposed on them uh, by, by actual constraints. Well, one of the, you know, again, I want to ask you again about uh, your experience in dealing with Iraq and its, and its subsequent history, but one of the things that I noticed, at least in 2002, mm -hmm. uh, was that the academy was virtually united in opposing them. Right. And, and then, you know, these eminent journals of opinion, The New Yorker, uh, the, um, the New York Times, right. uh, were either agnostic or uh, pretty much going along with it. And right. uh, it was just striking to me that, and, and, you know, there was that important, relatively important uh, a piece that was published on, on the op-ed page, taken out by so-called realists in American foreign mm -hmm. policy, saying, right. this is a crazy idea. Right. Um, but it didn't have any, I mean, right. didn't have any impact. Right. I just, right. uh, so uh, there is this real issue, which I'm trying to address here, yeah. you know, informally yeah. about yeah. about getting people to talk to each other about this. But also, yeah. but in terms of this right wrong, you know, yeah. uh, issue, I mean, yeah. Could come from. yeah, and I think the realist, you're right. I mean, I think the realists were the really critical <clears throat> element of that. And I actually think, and I did some look within my second book. I think that there were important realists who had, you know, in Washington, people like Gene Kirkpatrick, for instance. Um, and I think George Will, who actually privately were, were skeptical of the war and, and had every reason to be skeptical of the war. I mean, given that they were conservatives who didn't believe that, that you could change cultures, you know? That was his, that was his uh, foreign policy when he was running for office. Right, know, right, exactly. But, but you know, they, there was a, they, 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 were, they didn't speak. And then I think one of the things that happened in the academy is that, like, people who do Middle East studies are not in the business of advising the empire on how to be an empire, Sorry. right? Like, that's just not what they do. So, like, what, what should we do? I don't know, close up shop, you know? Like, um, so in a way, like, when it was a particularly true for a Republican administration, but even Democrats, who did they, they went to, like, Fuad Ajami and Bernard Lewis, because Bernard Lewis, basically, they, they accepted the idea that America should be in the Middle East militarily. And then you could say, well, what should we do in the Middle East, right? So I think that was part of this thing, which was so, I, you know, we're going to, 
I came to the New Republic right out of college and then after graduate school, came into a place that had this, had developed this very strong identity as kind of this kind of liberal hawk thing, place, which, which, which had started even in the 80s as the New Republic being a place that was kind of more anti-communist, you know, like supporting the deployment of MX. It started in the 70s, uh, you know, the, the whole staff walked mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. over that issue a year after Marty bought it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember Over what that. issue in particular? The Mayaguez incident, which mm -hmm. no one remembers. Mm -hmm. I remember. mm -hmm. um, they all quit. And I think the problem, my problem, which I kind of, my second book is really about this, really, was that I, I came of age at a, in a moment where this notion of a kind of more interventionist, more militarily interventionist kind of American foreign policy I, had a, I watched a series of experiences that seemed to validate that. So, you know, I was in college during, the big, two big foreign policy debates when I was in college were the Gulf War and then the bit over Bosnia. And the New Republic was kind of very involved in that, especially Bosnia and Kosovo. <coughs> Balkans was like, it became a very important part of the magazine's identity. And, and, and then, and also those, in retrospect, those debates, what it meant to actually win those wars was actually not, I think, ever sufficiently really thought through very well, but they kind of... Anyway, and so I think there, then I, I kind of then became an adult at the magazine in the wake of all of that, in the wake of September 11th. And it seemed like the lessons of these things were this terrible, terrible dictator. We've got an American military that's had a, been, on a, been able to be very successful. We've got a kind of unsustainable status quo where the sanctions are terrible and also probably not sustainable and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I think that that was the template, the kind of prism that I and some other, you know, like the Washington Post editorial page kind of, kind of bought into. And I was, and there was a certain, I think, certain kind of generational condescension towards people who had framed their views based on Vietnam, you know, because we grew up, people like me grew up basically with people saying that the Gulf War would be Vietnam. You know, I remember that was, a, and that Bosnia would be Vietnam. You know, very, very clearly a lot of very prestigious people saying both of those things, and it turned out not to be the case. And, um, and so in retrospect, I think I became caught up in a, in, I mean, that's why my book is about hubris, in a kind of a sense of a vastly inflated notion of, of American power and American knowledge and American morality, you know? And then, so after the war, when things went south and when, you know, when my sister-in-law got deployed there, uh, first to Iraq, then to Afghanistan, had to leave Perch, very small children, I, would, I thought, I, I have a real problem because I don't know how to write about, I'm interested in foreign policy, I just don't know what to think about it at all. Like, my whole model has been, has collapsed, you know, and I can't write inside this model anymore. So, I was, that's kind of what led me to, that took me certainly to my first book, but then the second book was basically about moments in American history where people, I, where I felt kind of hubris took over, and I tried to argue that it, that these, like, like if you go to, if you go to, when America's on a run of success, <clears throat> economic, ideological, military success, it tends to produce this kind of, and I felt like that's kind of had been the story that it influenced me <clears throat> in the 90s coming, starting even with Panama in the late 1980s. Um, and I became, I, you know, became, in, like, drawn to the realists of the mid, of the mid 20th century, people like Morgenthau and uh, Niebuhr uh, and Kennan, um, and who I think had a more, they weren't exactly, you know, had a more tragic, and, and limited view of, um, of what America should try to expect in, 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 to do in the world. Um, and um, so that, in a way, gave me like a new orientation. You know? But there were a lot of smart people who were there who didn't need to go through all that to get to that place, including you know, people mm -hmm. like Stephen Walt and, you know, for instance, John Mearsheim. Okay. Yeah, so that's... Uh, Sorry, I yes. went for it quickly because I need to leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. um, thank you very much. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself? Briefly. Sure, I'm Sally. I'm a fourth year student in the PhD program here. Um, I, I, um, and please bear with me. My question takes a while to explain. I have basically two questions, but I will have to tell you <coughs> how I got there. Um, and the recent events with uh, Jim Acosta accreditation being removed by the White House, etc., uh, made me go on the, the Wikipedia page of Jim Acosta and see, you know, what his educational background is. Jim Acosta has an undergraduate degree from the University of Wisconsin. West Virginia, if I'm not mistaken, in communication and communication studies and political science, doesn't major. And um, I went to class that day when his accreditation was removed. And I look at my pool of undergraduate students and I ask myself, well, some of them are senior students, they're about to graduate. 
And I asked myself, do I trust one of these kids going and covering the White House for me? Are, do I trust that one of these kids being the source of my news? I obviously do not. Now, Jim Acosta did not graduate last year, right? Um, he has been in the business for some time. But then, once you become a journalist in this <coughs> market that's very competitive, and you have to write very fast, and you know, considering all of the things you mentioned <coughs> right now, and then also some of my personal experiences with journalism, and the fact that because the, the business is so competitive, and because there are so few positions, you as a journalist would have to grab to any rope that's thrown at you. Uh, my very good friend, Jorgen Bates, was covering um, 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 the European Union for the AP, for the Associated Press in Brussels. That's where we worked together. I was, um, I was covering the AP for two years in Brussels and then in Paris. Um, um, Jorgen was covering um, Brussels for AP. Previous to that, he was covering environmental policy in Berlin at the Chancellery. <coughs> He was sent as the head of the bureau for um, DPA in Johannesburg. So he went to cover African politics of everything in Africa below Sub-Saharan Africa. And then I heard after four years of being there, he's going to be sent to Washington. And I asked myself, it, you know, how much can you grow in this job if you're constantly throwing these ropes at them? You would have to <coughs> with them to grow up and you know, become um, a political correspondent from a normal correspondent and then become a bureau chief if you, know, if you get the opportunity, because that's great. Uh, but then you, know, you remain with that undergrad degree that you have from 10 years ago, and then you, you have to cover Africa, and then suddenly you have to cover Washington, and then you have to cover EU politics. And I just asked myself, well, maybe Jim Acosta has remained in the field that he, has, he started working in. Maybe he's amassed this amount of experience that's really great. But it just seems very unrealistic to me as an academic that somebody gets to collect that amount of information about an area that they're covering within the span of three or four years. Now, also... Is that, is that, well, is it, it, sorry? Is that enough for you to let them answer? To no, I haven't gotten to my question. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, Maybe quickly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I asked myself, um, when, you know, people at Jim Acosta work for um, uh, networks that are uh, focused so much on entertainment, right? Uh, we had Brian Jones here, um, he teaches American politics, if you know him. He gave us a lecture on uh, how forecasting is done and how Fox News and CNN use political scientists for forecasts um, on election night. And then we asked him, so what's the value of this? You know, you, you have all this quantitative analysis that you do. And he said the value of it is a few hours of entertainment. So that election night, and that's it. So I ask myself, if you are working um, in this environment, which is so fast-paced and for which um, so little knowledge is required at the end of the day, and, and where you would have to you know, focus on emotions because that's all people care about. So you have to stand in front of the president and push him so far until he comes up with something so unrealistic. And then you go back to your network and, and talk about you know, some bombastic statement that the, that the president came up with. If, you, if our journalists in our TV channels um, are these kind of personalities. I don't know how we could trust the news that we get. So, um, I'm going to.